But even with all this, it is sufficiently uniform on cosmological size scales to justify using a metric that assumes perfect homogeneity and isotropy. We need to do a much deeper analysis of the FLRW metric in order to understand its connection to gravity. Since gravity is a dynamic process that causes things to move, and since you've probably heard the phrase, matter tells gravity to how to curve, and curvature tells matter how to move, we should expect that a space-time's effect on mass and energy should be something like a slope down a hill. In practical terms, this means a rate of change with respect to spatial or temporal variables. What this looks like mathematically are the first and second derivatives of the space-time metric. For the ease of our calculations, so we don't carry around a bunch of stuff, I'm going to do the standard cosmological convention of setting c equal to 1. This is because c, being a speed, is actually a conversion factor between meters and seconds. When you geometrize the world, you try to put everything in terms of length. I went over this process when I discussed Planck units way back in my chapter 1 video. Here, we're not worried about the highfalutin philosophy, we just don't care to write c everywhere. And since it's legal, we'll just do that. Also, I'm going to do this whole exercise starting with the reduced circumference coordinates of the FLRW metric. They look prettier than the hyperspherical coordinates, in my opinion, and are commonly used in the literature. Later, I'll go back and contrast the result with the hyperspherical coordinates to show that the space-time really is the same no matter what coordinates you use for the metric. But for now, we want to develop the process with this form. First, I put the metric into what I did with the matrix, with the G sub whatever whatever. These are just the tensorial labels for each element in the space-time interval equation. I then raise the indices of the metrics components. That's the group off to the right. To raise both, the end result is to make the inverse of the component. The metric times its inverse is the identity matrix, which means that each component times its inverse is just one. You can see that all the exponents in the raised version now have a minus sign. We'll need these raised index g's later. Across the bottom are all the non-zero first derivatives of each of the components. I'm using a common shorthand notation for the derivative, the comma notation. Remember that all of these are rates of change with respect to some other coordinate in the metric. All the spatial metric components have a time derivative and a radial derivative, but only one has an angular derivative concerning theta. Typically, we might call first derivatives slopes or gradients. However, in a non-Euclidean spacetime, we need more elements to get that gradient. These are only partial derivatives and not the whole story. To describe the connection between the metric and gravity, we have a lot of mathematical juggling to do. First, we need to calculate what are called the Christoffel symbols associated with this metric. We saw these before when we looked at the parallel transport and traveling along geodesics. These symbols, defined by the green equation across the top, connect the metric to the shape of the manifold itself. What they describe is basically how a vector changes from one point to another in the space-time. You do need something in your mathematics to account for the fact that your coordinate system changes along the way, in addition to any changes that may occur to the actual vector itself. The partial derivatives from the previous slide don't do this. Such derivatives always assume that the basis doesn't change, but in a curved space, the basis vectors do change. And then, to account for this, we're going to replace the ordinary partial derivative with what's called the covariant derivative. The part of the covariant derivative that keeps track of the changes arising from the change in coordinates is this Christoffel symbol. They encode how much the basis vectors of the coordinate system change as we move along in the direction of the basis vectors themselves. This changing derivative as we move through the spacetime is exactly what we expect from a curved spacetime. We know that the values of the metric change as we putter around the spacetime, so that means compared to where you are now, a nearby location in curved space rotates, translates, and boosts a vector you place over there. What we see across the top are all the elements that go into calculating the wad of Christoffel symbols you see across the bottom. We see that the symbols rely on the partial derivatives from the previous slide and the raised index metric. If you look carefully, for a given value of m, i, and j, we need to sum over the index l. Fortunately, because of the symmetry of the metric, these are pretty easy to calculate. It's not really critical to go over all of them, but you should notice that there are a lot of symbols that are equal. 
There are also a lot of them where the symmetry of the spacetime has made the symbols symmetric in the i and j lower indices. Next, time derivatives of the scale factor only appear in the symbols where t is one of the indices. And the curvature constant k only appears in four symbols, where the GRR component of the metric raises its head. Now let's put these symbols to work. We'll work them using the Riemann curvature tensor. In a much earlier lecture, I described the process of how we can determine curvature by parallel transporting a vector around a short loop following geodesics. If the space is curved, then the vector's final orientation and possible magnitude will deviate. The curvature tensor, which you can think of as a powerful function, takes as inputs the coordinate basis for the space, some vector you want to push around the space, and the lengths of the sides of the loop, and spits out a little vector that is a measure of the space's curvature. In this diagram, the starting vector is yellow v with an arrow over it down in the lower right. That's the red arrow pointing straight to the right above it. We then parallel transport yellow v counterclockwise around the loop back to its original location. This loop finishes with the orange arrow. The orange arrow differs from the original red arrow by some delta v, which is seen in the little green arrow. The Riemann curvature tensor is the object that tells us how much and in what direction little green delta v is pointed. We saw that the Christoffel symbols are composed of first derivatives of the metric and show that these are a gradient along a geodesic. The curvature tensor is composed of either derivatives of the Christoffel symbols or a product of two Christoffel symbols, and this works out to be second derivatives of the metric overall. To connect it to gravity, we next need the Ricci curvature tensor. We see that it looks a lot like the Riemann tensor, but we're summing up over the first and third indices. To indicate this, I've changed rho and mu to a, and I've also changed the index nu to i and sigma to j. The Ricci tensor is important for the upcoming work, so let's calculate some of its values for our metric. Our first component we'll calculate is the time-time component of the Ricci tensor. I've pulled all the Christoffel symbols along to view, but it's really the four parts of the tensor I want to show you. The first two parts are partial derivatives. The red one across the top is zero. Using the Einstein summation convention, there are four things to add up to make up the red equation but each relies on a Christoffel symbol with TT as a lower index. All four possibilities are zero, so their sum is zero. The next one, in orange, we do have to worry about. There are three non-zero symbols, which all happen to be equal. When we take the partial derivative with respect to time, we get two terms that only depend on the scale factor and its time derivatives. Double dot means two time derivatives, and single dot means one. For those with a very keen eye, this kind of looks like an acceleration and a velocity squared, which are related to energies, and that's good because gravity chats about potential and kinetic energy. But it's far too early to start in with that yet. We've only just started. The third equation in blue is zero for the same reason the red one is, and the fourth equation in purple adds up three identical terms with the first being zero. To get the Ricci tensor for the time-time component, we add all these up. Happily, two of the terms cancel, leaving a rather simple result which we'll pull together in a moment. The RR component of the Ricci tensor is a real mess. There are a large number of terms, and only a few of which are zero. Again, the top two are the first two terms in the Ricci tensor summation, which each themselves are sums over partial derivatives. The bottom two are also sums of products of Christoffel symbols. The RR component has a lot of curvature constant k terms, a few scale factor terms, but no presence of theta or phi coordinates anywhere. The radial symmetry, meaning the isotropy of the space, is apparent with that. When we add everything up, we get a lot of canceled terms. This makes the final result of the RR component of the Ricci tensor really a simple looking thing across the bottom. Now, just for the sake of brevity and the fact that I went a little crazy with all this, I'm going to skip over showing you the nitty-gritty of the theta-theta and phi-phi components of the Ricci tensor. If you wish, you can pause the video and try doing the algebra for yourself. I did for this video, so it's not impossible. It's just a bit tedious. Perhaps someone in the comments will point to a Mathematica script that would create and solve these. That'd be fun to see.